Good morning. It is an honor, a privilege, and a joy to be here in Ferguson, Missouri, and to be with you. Uh, to, uh, to, our, to your mayor, uh, your police chief, uh, to the, the leaders and the gatekeepers of this community, I am indeed honored. I want to thank uh, Ms. Vivian Dudley for her leadership and uh, her energy and enthusiasm as well. It was certainly a joy to meet so many of you on behalf of my wife, myself, and our staff from the Urban Alternative who are here, it is a joy to be with you. When I first got a call and asked, would I come, I asked a question. And the question was, would it be possible if I agreed to come to meet with the leadership of the community? Because that would inform my answer. Uh, I get uh, hundreds and hundreds of requests to go a lot of different places, but one of the questions I always ask is, can I meet with the leadership? Because last night was a great event. But this morning will determine the future. And uh, it is a joy to be able to be with you. Your son of peace scripture, taken from Jeremiah 29, 11, I have a plan for you, saith the Lord, a plan for your well-being and not for your calamity to give you a future and to give you a hope. Oh, that's a great verse in a bad chapter. <laughs> Jeremiah 29 is not a good chapter. If you read verse 4, he says, you're in exile because you've disobeyed me. He says, your families are falling apart. Your economic culture is falling apart. And you're now in a pagan environment called Babylon, and it's your fault. But in a bad chapter, we got a good verse. I have a plan for you, saith the Lord, a plan for your well-being and not your calamity, to give you a future and to give you a hope. It's not only a great verse in a bad chapter. It's a great verse in a bad chapter located in a bad book. If you're depressed, don't read Jeremiah for devotions. That's not the book you want to read. Because that's just judgment after judgment after judgment after judgment after judgment. But in a bad book with a bad chapter, we still got a great verse. I have a plan for you, saith the Lord, a plan for your well-being and not your calamity. To give you a future and to give you a hope. What is hope? Hope is joyful expectation about tomorrow. Hope says where I'm going is better than where I am or where I've come from. Hope means my future will be better than my past. And so with this theme of hope and your gathering today, uh, what, uh, what started out as a catastrophe can be turned around to a glorious, transforming blessing. So I feel honored, privileged to be with you today. I want to take the few minutes that I've been so graciously granted to share with you a worldview and a strategy uh, for your consideration. And a strategy, I think, that will take into consideration all the good things that are already happening here and seek to see them uh, and us support you because that's what we do. We are not trying to impose anything on you. We're trying to support you and what God has called you to do. But first of all, let me start with the worldview. The worldview is how the world works. Second Chronicles chapter 3, verses 3 to 6 says, In those days there was no true God, no teaching priest, and no law. It says, citizen rose up against citizen because there was no peace to him who went in or went out. It says, nation rose up against nation. And then it said, city rose up against city. So you had societal collapse. And then it says, for God troubled them with every kind of distress. Now, if God is your problem, only God is your solution. You can't elect your way out of that, politic your way out of that. Not if God's your problem. What you and I are experiencing today, not only in the events of Ferguson, but in the devolution of our culture, is the passive wrath of God. There is the active wrath of God in Scripture where you see fire and brimstone. But then there is the passive wrath of God that is defined in Romans chapter 1. It says, because they no longer retain the knowledge of God, God turned them over. The passive wrath of God is when God lets you live life without him. He gives you the, he gives you the desire of your heart to leave him out. But when he gives you that desire, then you bear the consequences of that choice. What we have watched in our society 
is the uh, removal of God from the center of culture and put out on the loop. You know, most big major cities have loops that go around the city. So the loops are like close enough to have access but far enough not to be bothered with. We want God for invocations and benedictions as long as he stays out of the issues in the middle. And because of the removal of God across the culture, including the church, because of the removal of God's person and precepts while still using his name, we are seeing the passive wrath of God. And if God is your problem, only God is your solution. At the end of the 20th century, one of the great diseases that we had to address was acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS. AIDS is a breakdown, was a breakdown of the immune system, and our immune systems are designed to be repellents against bacteria and viruses that would shut down the body. But when you contracted the uh, AIDS virus, your immune system was so damaged that you couldn't repel simple things that normally wouldn't bother you. Now, AIDS would never kill you. It would set you up for something else to kill you. Colds would become pneumonia. You would be more susceptible to cancer. So it set you up for something worse to happen. What you and I are experiencing today is a case of spiritual AIDS. That is, the breakdown of the immune system and God's immune system in society is the church. It is the job of the church to reflect the immune system of God so that the bacteria and viruses of evil do not turn cultural colds into societal pneumonia. And that is what we are experiencing today. And since God is the problem, no politician is the solution. There must be the reintroduction of God into the culture. And therein is where the church comes in. The church is called his body. And the job of a body is to reflect the dictates of its head. Your body only does what your head tells it to do. That's why when a person has a disease of the brain, it shows up in the dysfunction of the body. Well, since our head has no disease, and since Jesus Christ is perfect in every detail, we have a flawed body with a great head. So we have a disconnect in the central nervous system. The flow down and the disconnect is the disunity of the church. Jesus' prayer was that they might be one. Oneness does not mean sameness. We went into that when we talked about the theology of the Trinity. One God composed of three, three co-equal persons who are distinct in personality while simultaneously being one in essence. So sameness is not unity. Sameness is a oneness of purpose. In football, there's only one goal line, but there are 11 different positions on the field, but they're all headed toward that one goal line. So they're singular in purpose, although differentiating themselves by position. We have the Baptists and Methodists and Pentecostals and, you know, black and white and Hispanic. We have all these different positions, but each position has set up their own goal line. And when each position sets up their own goal line, you will have confusion on the field, which means there's going to be chaos in the stands. So because there's confusion on the field, there's chaos in the stands. And so you get a Ferguson, you get a, 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 a crisis in Chicago that they can't heal. Uh, and all of these things are in conflict with one another. So the goal and the vision is to set forth an agenda based squarely on scripture that communities can use as a template to draw from in order to see this reverse. We only have two options. One option to get out of this mess is the return of Christ. Now, if Jesus Christ comes, we don't have to worry about any of this. All right, But if he doesn't come for another 200 years, you better worry about all of this. Because that's our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren that are going to grow up in some kind of world. And it will be the world that they're experiencing now or a better world that we hand over to them. 
Now, some people say theologically, well, why should we go through all of this, uh, uh, you know, all of this since Jesus is coming back and the, and the world is going to get worse? Well, the same reason you jog, even though you know you're going to die. I mean, the reality of death doesn't produce lack of health care. It produces increased health care. And so uh, given the condition of the culture and the spiritual aids that is set in, it is time for the church to be the church. I am at my core an ecclesiologist. Ecclesiology is the biblical doctrine of the church. That's where I spend a great deal of my time as a churchman. And that's where our national ministry, the Urban Alternative, focuses in. And that's why I was so elated when I received the invitation to join you as you seek to better your community and this philosophy we're taking across the country. As was stated in the, in, in the introduction, the philosophy is simply called the kingdom agenda. The kingdom agenda is defined as the visible demonstration of the comprehensive rule of God over every area of life. God's kingdom is divided into four categories and only four categories. And these four categories in scripture are called covenants. Covenants are God's administrative mechanisms for how his kingdom operates. They're outlined in uh, my favorite passage of scripture. Time will not allow us to go through it, but in Psalm 128, they're outlined the four categories, the individual, the family, the church, and the society, which is the government. When God is able to sync those four, the individual impacting the family, the families collectively impacting the church, the church overflowing into the community, then you have an ordered society. When those four are out of sync, when impacts, when, when individuals function dysfunctionally in a family, bringing family chaos, you will have dysfunctional churches and there will you will have impotent communities. And so it is this flow of covenantalism which establishes God's kingdom that establishes order in society. The absence of God's kingdom. The church exists for the kingdom. The church does not exist for the church. So as long as the church exists for the church, you will have divided churches because my church exists for my church. Your church exists for your church. But if all churches exist for the kingdom, then that means all churches are existing for something bigger than any, any one church could ever be on its own. And so the goal is to establish a, a kingdom agenda initiative that churches can use in every community, and if all communities do it, well, that brings in the whole nation, okay? So this is not a top-down philosophy or a top-down strategy. It is a bottom-up philosophy and a bottom-up strategy, of course, coming from the Lord. Uh, I'll get into the strategy in just a second, but you remember two very wicked cities were Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, there was moral breakdown, there was family breakdown, there was social breakdown. Uh, Ezekiel 16 says that one of the reasons God destroyed Sodom was because of its oppression, injustice, and neglect of the poor. Now, that's often not associated with Sodom and Gomorrah, but, uh, but Ecclesiastes 16 says that's one of the reasons it was destroyed. So there was social breakdown. So there was chaotic. And God says, well, I'm going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to destroy those cities. But when you read Genesis chapter 18, you find something very interesting. Abraham tries to cut a deal with God. Abraham says, if I can find 50 righteous, will you save the city, not because the city deserves to be saved, but for the sake of the righteous? And God agrees with the deal. He says, if you will find me 50 folk who are on my page, okay, then for the sake of the 50, I'll save the 500,000, okay? Abraham comes back and says, what about 40? He couldn't find 50. God says, well, I'm, I'm good with 40. We can go with 40. Abraham comes back and says, what about 30? Because he couldn't find 40. What about 20? Comes back and says, what about 10? So the question on the floor is, why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? It was not merely destroyed because of the evil of the city. It was destroyed also because the righteous couldn't be located. The righteous couldn't be located. Now, he did have a righteous guy named, named Lot. Okay? But Lot suffered from the American disease of personal peace and affluence. Uh, he, was, he was in the, his world, 
and, uh, and because he never disseminated his world, the culture got destroyed. He had two sons-in-laws, two daughters, his wife and himself, okay, as six people. If each one of them would have won one other person, that would have been 12 people. Abraham would have found 10, and Sodom and Gomorrah would still be on the map. But because he was ingrown and did not impact, the culture had to be destroyed. So, trust me, the passive wrath of God will allow us to destroy ourselves unless he is returned and the righteous can be located. We have enough in this room right here today for God to change his mind about Ferguson. We have enough in this country for God to change his mind about America. If, in fact, the righteous can be located in a unified way. The strategy is outlined in the white brochure. If you will pull this out, we call it a kingdom agenda strategy for community transformation. A kingdom agenda strategy for community transformation. This is what we would like to offer for you that we offer across the country for you to consider. In the center slot is the discussion of a summary of the kingdom agenda so that you understand it. On the right-hand side, I say we need more than a protest. We need a plan. Okay? We, we need more than a protest, and I could go on to say we, we need more than a, a meeting. We need a plan. So here is a plan for your consideration. This is not to be imposed. It is simply to be considered. On the right-hand side of the brochure are the three steps that we would like you to consider to engage in as a community. Number one, the first ingredient of the strategy, an annual unified solemn assembly of pastors and congregations for the purpose of spiritual celebration, commitment, and revival. In the Bible, when there was social collapse, God or the, the leaders of the community would call for a solemn assembly. A solemn assembly means a sacred gathering. The purpose of the sacred gathering was to re-invite God's manifest presence into their midst. The purpose of a sacred gathering was unified, because they called the whole community together, to recall God and his manifest presence. God is present but you don't always have his manifest presence. That means where you can see him working. You know he's there, but you want to see him working. So that's his manifest presence. Now, the reason why a solemn assembly was called was because his manifest presence was missing. And there was spiritual and social collapse. Ezra called a solemn assembly. Nehemiah 8 calls a solemn assembly. Esther calls a solemn assembly. You have it flowing all through scripture and church history. The civil rights movement was born out of a solemn assembly, the calling of the churches together in a unified way to deal with unjust laws uh, in the Jim Crow South. Those were simply forms of a solemn assembly. What you did last night was awesome, but the great danger is it being a one-time event. Come on. See, if, if all you did was have a, a kumbaya moment, uh, and we all felt good for the folks who were there, then it will just die as another event. But if you said annually there will be a coming together of all the churches inviting their congregations led by the pastoral leadership so that there will be in our community a corporate call for God's manifest return into the midst of this community through the gatekeepers of this community because God responds to his church, not just to anybody who's just happened to mention his name or praying before a city council meeting. He calls for his church. And so if the church invites him in, he knows it's a real invitation. All right? Because, you know, you can get some invitations from folk, but you know that ain't real. They're just being polite. God's not interested in polite invitations. He wants to know this is a real invitation. And, and the way he knew it was a real invitation was by fasting and prayer. Why fasting? Fasting was connected with it because fasting was giving up the physical to gain the spiritual. In other words, I'm giving up something in the physical world because right now the spiritual world is more important. So it was expressing a priority. 
So if the pastors would meet leading up to a solemn assembly, pastors praying together, and you come together like you did last night and see that thing grow and grow and grow on an annual basis, and if it's annual, that means it doesn't interfere with your individual church programming, then you have now the gathering of the Church of Ferguson or the Church of St. Louis made up of the churches. The churches make up the church so that there becomes one church. One church with its many expressions, you know, in your community. So you start off with inviting God's return to the midst of his people. Second strategy is number two, an ongoing unified impact through the adoption of public schools for the purpose of impacting the lives of young people and their families through mentoring and family support services. The Bible says that we are to demonstrate our goodwill through our good works. Good works are not merely good things. You don't have to be a Christian to do a good thing. Non-Christians do good things all the time. They build hospitals, they build orphanages, they're philanthropists, they feed the poor. They mean, so you don't have to be a Christian to do a good thing. Only Christians can do good works. Good works is more than a good thing. Matthew chapter 5 verse, six, verse 16 says, let your light so shine that men will see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. Not their father, your father. Okay? In other words, a good work is something you do that non-Christians see the benefit of. Okay? It is biblically authorized and God always gets the credit for it. That's why they glorify your father. To glorify means to show off something to amplify something, to put it on a billboard. It's uh, advertise something. So we are to advertise God, not merely with our good words, but with our good work, something that benefits the community. Jeremiah 29, 7 says, Seek the welfare of the city in which you found yourself, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. All right? They were in a pagan city called Babylon. And he says, As evil as this city is, I want you to make it a better place to live. So the question is, how can we make Ferguson a better place to live? Why do we focus on schools? The reason we focus on schools is because schools already have an infrastructure. Okay? The church is an infrastructure, the family is an infrastructure, and schools are an infrastructure. So all you need is a dating service. The dating service connects the church with the school because they have the kids, the kids have parents, so that means family. That's church, school, and family, so you just hit the whole community right there. And you also impacted the future because the kids are the future. But we know one of the reasons we're having problems with our kids is because of the breakdown of the family. And so teachers now have to be social workers and academicians. So if the church goes into the school, and becomes the social service provider for the, uh, 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 for the families, then the teachers can focus on education and allow uh, the church to be the social service provider. God says that I will be a mother to the motherless and a father to the fatherless. Now, he didn't mean some floating spirit in Never Never Land. He meant he would work through his people to provide surrogate parenting. Many of our children don't have fathers or they have uh, mothers who have to work two jobs and can't do all that needs to be done to treat their, their, chi their children dignity and responsibility and follow up on homework and all that kind of stuff and so you see this dropout rate you see this deterioration but if you said if a if, if a church said if every school in Ferguson got adopted by a church that provided mentoring tutoring and family support services to the at-risk students in the school Better yet, if churches across racial lines adopted the same school, then you would have racial reconciliation through service, not through seminars. We don't need more seminars. As I say in the book on race over here called Oneness Embrace, the goal of reconciliation is not reconciliation. See, one of our problems is we reconcile to be reconciled. That's not big enough. The purpose of reconciliation or the way to reconciliation is through service. 
we're reconciled to God in order to serve. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. So the goal of reconciliation is to serve somebody else. You know, you know, you know it, when, when you're in a war, you don't care about the color, class, or culture of the man fighting next to you as long as he's shooting in the same direction you are. All right? We are in a war for our children, a war for our families, and if you are a different color, class, or culture than me, but we shooting at the same enemy, we can hang out in the same foxhole, okay? Well, we got the same enemy in the deterioration of our culture, and so we say, Let's adopt every school. Let's invade every school. You've got a, a program already that's been started here. I met the brother over here that, that has begun that process here in the back, and uh, I met the assistant superintendent here, and, and she's doing some things in school. So you already have, I hear you have a Christian superintendent here, so you already have the infrastructure. What we do at the Urban Alternative is provide the training strategy. So we have a training team led by Bill Collins over here, and, and uh, it can be done online, or we have a team that comes to community gathers together all the churches or the representatives of the churches. We come in on a Saturday or one day and we provide the training. We have the resources to do it and uh, uh, of, of, of what you need for it. We're coming out with mentoring manuals that you can use to, to, to work with the kids. That'll be out uh, in the spring of this year. So we're providing these materials for you to use and the training if you would like us to come and support this effort. And so the beautiful thing about this, however, and I know uh, Ms. Deli is going to come up in just a moment talk about this a little bit more is that you can plug anything else into it for example i know you have an adopt the block uh, a strategy where you adopt every block well if you adopt every block you're adopting families okay you're adopting homes well if you're ministering to the kids of these families in the school and then you are touching them at their homes in the neighborhood then this becomes an outlet you can plug all the different things that are already operating in the community if there's a homeless struggle if there's a food problem if there's a this problem then you got these different ministries that can plug into these different problems but you have an infrastructure that will never get old because with the school you'll always have new kids which means you'll always have new families which means you'll always have the community so church school and family now so that's number two three is a unified voice for publicly addressing the key issues facing your community from a kingdom based biblical perspective and so what you have uh, and number three is because you've asked God to return strategy one because you're doing good work strategy two now folk will pay attention to you strategy three so now, when the church comes together, see, I, I saw on the news last night, they played a little clip from the meeting last night. They played a clip of uh, the gathering last night because Christians came together in light of what happened in the community. Now, if you're turning the community around as a unified effort, you're going to get more than a clip. You're going to have a voice. And everybody will know before we do anything in Ferguson, we got to check with the church first. Because they're the ones doing the good work, and they're the ones making the impact, so they're the ones we need to pay attention to on the front end. See, folk come to the church on the back end and want us to clean stuff up. Uh, no, that's, called, that's the wrong song. That's called backwards Christian soldiers. We want to go onward Christian soldiers, which means what we want to be is consulted on the front end. But you've got to have the good works that draws the attention in a unified way. So that's the threefold strategy that anything else can be plugged into that gives you a stable way for ongoing impact in the community. Uh, uh, the Adopt the School brochure gives you some of the details of our training that we offer. And what we become is consultants to your community. We're putting together a discipleship template. It's a whole other subject. I won't go into it. But the discipleship template simply says that we got to go beyond creating members and we need to create disciples. Because without discipleship, you'll have membership with no impact.